welcome to the Southboro Library. My name is Kim Larkin. I travel throughout Connecticut and Massachusetts presenting creative programming. And I've been to the Southboro Libra Library quite a few times and I'm glad to be back presenting uh, my aromatherapy program. Uh, my background is in uh, visual arts, teaching for over 20 years and I taught in my libraries and I have my certification in professional aromatherapy. So I'd like to share my passion with you today and hopefully uh, if you have an interest, you can uh, stock your essential oil pantry and get started uh, having a uh, cleaner home, a healthier home, and uh, learning about some applications for your personal use as well. So we have a display here and we'll be going over everything uh, a little bit at a time. I'm gonna be talking about the essential oils that I use as sort of a starter kit. Uh, and I am not affiliated with any MLM, so I'll teach you how to find the best organic uh, oils um, and places where I shop for things. At the end of the program, you'll be able to go to the South Bur Southboro Library website and find uh, the lib guides, which will have a PDF of all the resources that I use and some of the recipes that we'll be going over as well. So you can uh, check that out. We're going to be talking about the essential oils, some of the botanicals that I use in my programs. Normally we have a workshop where we put things together, but I still want to demonstrate that. And they're very simple and things that you can do at home with friends and uh, have uh, a nice time enjoying the essential oils in your home and getting to know them. Uh, we're gonna be talking about uh, some of the in influential people in aromatherapy. I am gonna talk a little bit about the history of aromatherapy, which I think is actually fascinating uh, and how we, come, we have come to really benefit from the cultures before us that have developed these uh, distillations and learned about the healing benefits of the essential oils. And I'm going to introduce you to some carrier oils and carrier lotions and what those actually are. And then we'll do a little, um, a little workshop uh, craft here to show you what uh, you can do at home. So the first thing I wanna start with is just as with anything uh, that you're going to touch or ingest, let's in this case we're not ingesting, but touching and having direct application to your hands, we want to talk about safety first with essential oils. So even though it's a natural product, they're natural oils from the plant kingdom, uh, they are not meant to be applied directly onto our skin. They're very highly concentrated, so we are going to learn about dispersing them dispersing the concentration in oils or lotions so that they become safer and we're able to use them. So the first thing is you never ingest essential oils. Uh, you also keep the oils away from the mucous membranes in your eyes. That's very important. Essential oils should always be diluted in some form of a carrier. It's recommended that you use a skin patch test. So if you have highly sensitive skin or you think you might be allergic to something, uh, the idea is to put a little of the essential oil you might be working with or thinking about on a cotton ball. You can put just a dab on um, a Band-Aid and then apply it to your skin. Very light application in oil and you'll be able to tell if you have a reaction in 12 to 24 hours. Uh, the next thing uh, are home care recipes. So I'm going to give you a few recipes on the PDF of how to have uh, cleaning supplies for the home. And with those, you even should do a patch test kit. So let's say you uh, have a porous granite countertops or you have a natural concrete slab in your kitchen. You want to make sure in an inconspicuous place that you use these because the essential oils will be present in the product and you don't want anything to mar your, your surfaces. Also, you should always check with your doctor. Very important before you use essential oils. Um, if you're pregnant, if you're nursing, if you're trying to conceive, if you have high blood pressure, if you're on any homeopathic remedies, if you're taking medications, and if you have epilepsy, all of these conditions and possibly 
more can be affected uh, because uh, there might be an interaction. So you just want to play it on the safe side and make sure to consult your physician before if you have these uh, um, precautions or if you take these precautions, you'll be well advised to and be safe. And that's what we want to be safe. Uh, I'm going to start talking a little bit about how we use essential oils um, and how we can benefit from them, which is really great. Firstly, you've probably heard about diffusers in the home. So they're sold everywhere now, and I brought mine. This is a little diffuser that you use uh, with uh, drops of essential oil in the chamber with some distilled water. So that turns into a vapor and allows it to uh, sort of uh, mist the, the air in the home. Now, this is a great product, but you have to also be cautious if you have young children in the home or small animals, you wanna make sure the essential oils you're using aren't going to irritate their skin or their eyes and you should have adequate ventilation because they have smaller bodies. So that's important. Uh, there is also another diffuser called the nebulizing diffuser that you might have seen. And that is uh, one where you can use 20, approximately 20 minutes at a time because what happens is when you put the essential oil in the diffu this type of a diffuser, it doesn't dilute it with water. So it just turns the essential oils into a mist. So you're getting um, more bang for your buck uh, in terms of benefit. So that's something to look into, a nebulizing diffuser if you're interested uh, in having a cleaner product, um, a more concentrated product. Another way that we use uh, essential oils is some people actually put the drops of the essential oil on a cotton ball if they feel like they want to be energized. They'd use peppermint oil and you can breathe it in and inhale that aroma off the cotton ball. Or another wonderful way is using an inhaler. So this is a little inhaler. You can buy these on Amazon. It's a little, they come in little kits. And what it is, uh, is inside this little tube is um, a cotton wick. And you take the cotton wick out and you saturate it with your essential oils, approximately 15 drops of your essential oils. And then the wick will absorb uh, the essential oils. And then you place it in the chamber and snap it into place. So this becomes your inhaler. And so if you feel like being energized, like we were saying with peppermint, you would just breathe that in and you would get immediate results. It has been proven that within 30 seconds of inhalation, we get the benefit from uh, direct inhalation, 30 seconds. So how do we even breathe in essential oils and have them benefit us? So this shows a, a picture of someone inhaling an essential oil, it's going up through your nasal passages and it goes to the olfactory bulb in your brain into the limbic system and then it gets uh, transmitted through your autonomic nervous system down through your body and it can have immediate effect. For instance, lavender is sedative, peppermint is energizing, so sedative or stimulating, usually they uh, have one or the other. So that is how we benefit immediately. This says our sense of smell is 10 times stronger than our other senses, which is amazing. Um, this is a famous quote by Helen Keller, and I think it really speaks volumes. She said, smell is a potent wizard that transports us across a thousand miles and all the years we have lived. So it reminds us that scent is tied in with our emotion. So if you think about, we'll bring up peppermint again, you think of peppermint, that might remind you that your grandmother when you were five years old used to make you peppermint hot chocolate with marshmallows and that gives you great you know, memories. Or you might smell roses and you might remember walking through your grandfather's rose garden and that would bring, bring wonderful memories, tying in sense with emotion. So that's really great. That's another benefit. Um, another way we can use essential oils is by tenting. 
So we all remember way back in the day when you had a head cold when you were a little child and your mother would put some hot water in a basin with a little bit, perhaps essential oils, maybe way back in the day, Vicks, uh, which is not an essential oil, but she would put a towel over your head and you would clear your nasal passages that way. So that's another way to get benefit through a steaming process. We also use sprays now and I'm gonna have a recipe on the PDF for how to make a clean uh, cleansing spray, refreshing spray for the room. And we're gonna be using distilled water when we use sprays so that it can stand and doesn't become stagnant. But this is a beautiful way you can make this spray. You can spray it in all four corners of the room and it can scent the room and cleanse the room, which it's really nice. I also love these little bottles. These are the PET bottles, so you can even carry these in your purse. I carry one in my purse, so especially these days, I carry it in my car, I spray it with peppermint, I spray it with orange oil, and we're going to learn that um, these essential oils are antibacterial, the five antis, and more actually, antibacterial, antifungal, antimicrobial, antiseptic, and antibacterial as well. So it's pretty amazing. Uh, they all contain some of these helpful antis, which we will learn about. We can also use essential oils with scrubs. So you can use dead sea salts or you can use regular sea salt as the base and add essential oils and some carrier oils and use that in the form of a lymphatic massage. So before you get in the shower, you can uh, have uh, the Dead Sea salts, the Dead Sea salt mixture and rub it briskly um, along your limbs up towards your heart and you're stimulating your energy or your chi, moving it toward the heart. And that way it helps with circulation and then you go into the shower and you rinse off. So of course you wouldn't use that in your tender areas. On your tender areas, you use a fine grain sea salt. Uh, so it's not abrasive in nature. You wouldn't use it definitely not any time uh, around the time that you've shaved, right? You've shaved your legs, that's a no-no. And uh, you wouldn't use it on any open cuts or sores. But otherwise, if your skin is in good condition, it's very helpful to help move your uh, lymphatic system around your body which is excellent. We're gonna make a foot soak in a little bit, which is I use all the time, and I think it's really highly beneficial, so I hope you enjoy that. Uh, we're gonna uh, also learn how to make some lotions and uh, massage oils as well. Those will be the carrier oils. So those are just a few ways that um, we use essential oils. We're also going to be using our botanicals in a dream pillow with essential oils. So we're gonna have, uh, I'll explain this in a little while, but this is some of our botanicals that I brought to show you in a nice organza bag so you can breathe it in. And it's a travel pillow. So this is nice, it can be used under your bed pillow, but I use it when I travel, especially on planes. I used to bring it all the time on the plane because it had the essential oils and the botanicals and it's very cleansing uh, for your nasal passages. Also, uh, the nasal inhaler is excellent for travel as well. These are some of the essential oils we'll talk about in a bit. So these, this is our little uh, stock pantry of essential oils. And you may not want to buy it all at once. You might want to start, you know, a few at a time, and that's perfectly fine. You see what you think of each scent, and you can build on it from there. We're going to talk about the benefits of aromatherapy. Uh, and finally, we're going to talk about um, the oils. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about the history of aromatherapy, which I think is pretty, pretty fascinating. So I hope you enjoy it. So first of all, the roots of aromatherapy go back to 4500 BC with the Egyptians. So they were the ones that were uh, dealing with the pharmaceuticals, the cosmetics, and the essential oils. Uh, perfume is Latin for per, meaning through, and fumi, which means smoke. 
So in Egypt, it's been documented that um, the women would walk around in the Egyptian sun and they would use these little conical incense coated in something called an unguent. The unguent was a fat uh, that had essential oils in it. And so when they went out into the sun, they would add, the fat would melt and <laughs> release the oils of the essential oils that they were using and it would create a perfume, which is amazing, but it sounds greasy. I'm not sure about that, uh, but that's what they did. Uh, the Egyptians were some of the first to use a technique called enfleurage. And basically, they used fat, they melted fat, and they took the botanicals, uh, and they would mix, the, mix it into the fat. And then the essential oils would be extracted from the heat of the fat. And then when it cooled, they would make like unguents or pomades, so they can apply it like perfume to their skin. I think it's fascinating. So in 1922, when they opened King Tut's tomb, they could still smell a strong scent of lavender that was included in the tomb. So that speaks volumes 3,000 years later. Uh, and then we move forward into China and about 2696 BC, Wang Ti, he wrote uh, the Yellow Emperor's classic of internal medicine. And so they were including prescriptions for healing with the aromatics. Um, they also use frankincense resin uh, to heal as well, and sandalwood, they believed, helped uh, people um, sort of uh, during the times of cholera uh, as protection. In 377 BC, Hippocrates, the father of medicine, he actually used aromatic massage. So he was including the essential oils of the plants, and he believed that by moving the lymphatic system around, it was very healing to the patient to have an aromatic massage. He was also credited with uh, clearing Athens of the plague by burning bundles of lavender and rosemary and juniper. It's amazing. The Greek soldiers also took myrrh into the battlefield to treat their infection and wounds. And both the Roman and the Greek cultures actually used lavender uh, to clean wounds as well. They also used it for insomnia and their, it's very highly uh, antiseptic properties. The Greek philosopher Aristotle, he actually believed that plants had psyches. So when we used essential oils, we were actually taking in the life force of the plant which is fascinating. In 372 uh, BC, Aristotle's student, his name was Theophrastus, he actually wrote a book called Concerning Odors. And uh, I laughed when I first read that many years ago, but what that actually was about was the uh, correlation between scent and emotion, way back when. And he actually is now referred to the father of bot as the father of botany. He determined that oils that were actually externally applied on the skin actually did have benefit internally. Um, and then in 77 AD, the Greek physician Dioscorides, he wrote a compendium called De Materia Medica, and that was used for 1,500 years going forward um, as the Bible of how to treat uh, uh, people via herbal medicine. He also prescribed lavender to the Roman troops to dress their wounds for the antibacterial uh, properties. And then both the Roman and Greek uh, cultures actually scented their waters, the famous uh, hygienic Roman baths. They scented the waters with boughs of uh, juniper, bay laurel, lavender, rosemary, and this is a picture of uh, a tile from the Roman baths. And this says lavare, to wash. That is a Latin verb, to wash, and that's where the name lavender came from. So they used it in the applications of the Roman baths to keep, keep the water hygienically clean. Uh, the Romans were actually consuming 3,000 tons of frankincense and 500 tons of myrrh annually to keep Rome clean. 
uh, between the oils and the burning and uh, keeping bacteria at bay. In the 10th century, the Persian alchemist Avicenna, he was really credited with refining steam distillation. And being in Persia, he uh, uh, distilled rose oil. Uh, he also highly detailed the benefits of the plant and the aromatic applications for healing. In the seventh century, um, the Taoists um, in the Far East were actually believing the same thing that Aristotle did, that when we used essential oils, we were liberating the life force of the plant. And the Japanese fans back then around that same time were carved from sandalwood. So the sandalwood, you're using the fan, and as you were using the fan, the essential oils from the sandalwood would benefit you and you would be breathing that in. And they called that the OG fan. Sandalwood is considered a sacred fragrance in India and uh, Ayurvedic medicine, and they believe that once the tree is over 15 years old, that's when the heartwood can be collected and ground and distilled into the essential oils. In India, the practice of Ayurvedic medicine, which dates back 5,000 years, uh, also believes in that same type of massage that Hippocrates believed in, only they call it Abhayanga. And it's similar in nature to what he talked about, but what they do is they use sandalwood, their sacred fragrance, and sesame oil. So sesame oil is very warming to the body. And what you do is you start um, with that mixture and uh, you would anoint your feet and then you would work your way up the long bones of your body, so of your calves and your thighs and your arms, uh, and work briskly toward the heart again, moving the lymphatics toward the heart. And then on your knees and your elbows, you would work in a circular motion along your joints. And then you work your way to the heart anointing your head and the tips of your ears. Uh, so it's sort of a self-blessing as well. Um, after Rome fell, we, we sort of entered the Dark Ages in the 6th through the 14th century, and herbal medicine started to be in dispute. Uh, once uh, the wise women of the village were healing people, and the next they might be into witchcraft. So in the 12th century, in the Rhine River Valley in Germany, there was a woman who was a Benedictine abbess. She was a mystic, she was a poet, she was an herbalist and a composer and an author. And her name was uh, St. Hildegard of Bingen. And she was very well versed with the healing power of plants. She actually wrote a book called The Cures, excuse me, The Causes and Cures of Illness, which detailed a lot of the botanical remedies that she found to be beneficial, including uh, many applications of lavender. She coined the term viriditas, and that really was sort of her term for the greening. Viriditas comes from the Latin greening plus truth. So she believed that people were sparks of the divine and so too, just like plants, people could regenerate if treated properly and healed as, as do plants regenerate. Uh, and for her powerful healing work with the plant kingdom, uh, years later, the, the church named her doctor of the church and she became St. Hildegard. She is fascinating. If you ever wanna read uh, a, a woman that did it all, pretty amazing. In the 15th century, a doctor that was born in Switzerland, he went by the name Paracelsus. He created healing medications with plants as well, but he was the one to name them Quinta Essentia, or essential oils in the 15th century. And then the abbeys and the monasteries were some of the places uh, that our aromatic cultivation really became uh, the place where um, physic gardens, that's what they called them, physic gardens. And so they named it that because they had medicinal applications. They were growing um, all sorts of uh, lemongrass and bay laurel and lavender and rosemary. Um, and that's where the physicians would go 
to learn the healing applications of the essential oils. Then we fast forward to the 1600s and French Carmelite nuns, they created something called Carmelite water, which contained uh, the calming herb Melissa. And then they actually infused it with, um, by steeping some angelica root. So that supposedly helped to strengthen patients and help with rheumatism and congestion as well. In the late 1800s, there was something called the Egyptian Ebers papyrus that was discovered, and that had over 700 medicinal plant usages listed on this papyrus, which of course people actually um, couldn't believe that there were so many since this dated back to 1550 BC. Uh, and of course, they knew all about mummification, and how the plants had antiseptic and antiviral properties. In mummification, um, the essential oils used were clove and cedarwood, lavender, um, and cinnamon as well. Um, it actually helped uh, the anti antibacterial proper properties, excuse me, help to delay the, uh, the decomposition of the body. And that's why when they found mummies, the, the flesh um, and the bodies were intact. In the early 1600s, the second wave of the plague struck England, and it was reported that the people that worked in the perfumeries seemed to be um, protected from the plague. And they thought that was due to the fact that they would handle the bundles and handle the distilled essential oils and, breathe, and they were breathing it in, working in the perfume factory, so they were protected in that manner with the essential oils. Even in the town of Bucklersbury in England, that was a port where um, the lavender, the European lavender trade was brought into England, and the people, again, seemed to be immune in that town. The French town of Gasse uh, was also a perfume center, and they noted that the residents in that town were actually seeming to be uh, protected with respiratory illness as well. Um, this is where thieves oil comes into play. You may have heard of thieves oil before. So thieves oil is a mixture that actually is sold by uh, the, the essential oil company Young Living. But what it really is uh, sort of is a, a derivation of is something called thieves vinegar or Marseille vinegar from Marseille, France. And what, what the story is is that there were a few thieves that were um, former perfume factory workers and they devised a recipe with uh, wormwood and whorehound and clove and rosemary and lavender steeped in vinegar. And then what they did was, supposedly they soaked their handkerchiefs that they used to um, pilfer uh, goods from people that died from the bubonic plague. Um, and they were protected. So they were finding these bodies that were robbed, but they couldn't figure out where are the people, you know, how, where are they and why aren't they affected? So supposedly it was the vinegar where the properties of the essential oils were extracted in the vinegar. So that's, um, and the, the thieves oil has similar, it doesn't have vinegar, but it has uh, similar oils, the clove oil, lemon, cinnamon, eucalyptus, and rosemary as well. Uh, and around that time, it's pretty interesting, there's a French leather glove maker, and they were actually, uh, um, scenting their leather gloves with boughs of lavender. And then they started to make the connection that people that were wearing the gloves seemed to be resistant to the cholera epidemic. So it's just amazing. In the 16th century, I say that a lot, I'm gonna have to, <laughs> it is amazing though. In the 16th century, the herbal strewers that would go before the royal family walking through the streets, um, they would actually strew the, the fresh flowers. And that wasn't just for pomp and circumstance, that was uh, for protection for the royal family so that as they threw down the flowers, when you walked upon the flowers, you crushed them and the essential oils would scent the path before the royal family, hoping to combat the bacteria of the open sewers, etc. 
So back in the Americas, we know that the, the Native American people, they use sage to clear um, their uh, sweat lodges and cure the sick with sage. In South America, the wood from the Palo Santo tree, um, which is uh, an endangered wood, is uh, Spanish for holy wood. It's burned for energetic cleansing, it's used to raise your vibration, enhance creativity, and it supposedly helps uplift your spirit. The wood can only be collected from dead or fallen trees, so the oil is then distilled from that wood. In uh, Queen Victoria's reign around 1837, uh, women would carry around something called a tussie mussy. So here's a tussie mussy, something similar to this. It would have lace and beautiful fabric, and tussy means a knot of flowers, and mussy means moist moss. So a knot of flowers in moist moss, and people would actually include herbs in that. Uh, they would actually put in sprigs of rosemary, uh, springs of sprigs of thyme, and uh, essential oils. And you would once again, just like the royal strewers, you would carry this through the street the open streets with, or the open sewers and the, um, the streets um, and you would breathe this in when the scents got to be too much. So you were protecting yourself because you were breathing in the essential oils directly, but it looked pretty too. So that's the tussie mussy. Um, also, men would carry uh, cedar lined snuff boxes. So the cedar is a very power antibacterial. Uh, so they would breathe that in, and men would carry walking sticks that had lattice uh, tops, uh, open lattice tops, and they would stuff botanicals in there as well. So they would walk with that and get the scent from the walking sticks as well. Uh, so now this brings us to um, the early 1900s and Dr. Edward Bach. So he was the inventor of Bach flower remedies and which we now can find in even the grocery stores, your health food store, your grocery stores, Whole Foods. And Dr. Edward Bach was a bacteriologist and a homeopathic physician from England. And he uh, was passionate about uh, bringing these flower remedies, the flower and tree essences to the world. He wanted to write um, a book to share with the world but at the time, around 1917, he actually fell ill. And what happened was he was given a dire prognosis. And so he thought, I am compiling this information and I can't leave yet. I have to bring this information to the world. So he, his premise was that there are 38 negative states of mind and there are flower and tree essences that can combat that. So that's what his work was, uh, developing these essences. So when he got that progno prognosis, he decided to move out to the glade of Oxfordshire, England with his team, and he actually distilled these flower and tree essences under the uh, full sunlight, and some say some uh, under the moonlight, and he actually created um, these Bach flower remedies. And there also is a Bach rescue remedy. A lot of people have heard of that, and uh, that's a combination of five different types of flower remedies. But um, you can actually go to some health food stores that actually carry the line of Bach remedies, and you can actually take a little quiz to what your issues are and then they can create a tincture that is uh, personalized just for you. And the tincture is really just suspended in a little bit of brandy, nothing to do damage, but just uh, you take it sublingually under the tongue and people really um, have good things to say about it. So this is a great book if you wanna learn more about it. This is fascinating called Bach Flower Therapy. Um, and he also has, or you can actually, uh, Look, um, look up Dr. Bach on uh, Bach's uh, Rescue Remedy online. 
So as we're winding down to the history, we come upon uh, a man named um, René Gattafos in 1928 in France. He actually was a chemist that worked in a perfume factory, and there was an explosion, and um, his arm and hand were severely burned. Uh, and a, the story goes he didn't know what to do, but there was a huge vat of oil next to him in the perfume factory. And his um, arm, he was in excruciating pain, so he plunged his arm into the vat, and it was uh, lavender oil, pure lavender oil. But the fascinating thing was that he felt that the pain lessened the longer his arm stayed in the vat. And when he took his arm out, um, the blistering stopped. Uh, he didn't need a graft. And so he actually, because of that accident, he changed his uh, um, sort of focus in life. And he actually wrote a book based on his findings of the, the, the truly healing benefits of lavender oil called aromatherapy. And so he was the one that coined the term aromatherapy. Uh, which is amazing that, you know, um, his research helped um, to inspire another doctor, uh, Jean Valnet, and he actually was helping um, the soldiers during World War I in France. And because of Dr. Valnet's work, they actually saved soldiers' limbs that uh, were being halted from the lavender oil, the gangrene was halted. Um, so they save life and limb from those two uh, works, research works. It's pretty amazing. And then in the 60s, um, Madame Margaret Maury, uh, she was from Austria. She was a biochemist, and she took the work of uh, Rene Gattafo. She was a student of, her, of his, and she took his work and applied it to her work um, with aromatic massage. I guess that would be Hippocrates' work too. Um, and she actually um, added the essential oils and the carriers. So she added carrier oils and carrier lotions to be applied um, through massage as a healing practice. Um, so that is our story of aromatherapy, um, a quick history. It's pretty amazing that all these different cultures have contributed to where we are today and um, we are now benefit benefiting from it. So I'll just go over a little bit of uh, what you can add to your pantry so you can get started as well. Okay, so we have our essential oils. Um, when I do my programs in person, I always have this sign up that says, use droppers with essential oils. Pouring is not allowed and dangerous. And I would say that's great advice. When you buy an essential oil, you will know, notice that there's a little plastic stopper normally inside the bottle, which is an orifice reducer. So that actually allows you to actually, when you hold the bottle at, um, eye level, you can actually count the drops um, and regulate how many drops. It matters how many drops you use per volume of oil or lotion. And we'll have that on our recipes. Uh, more is not better with essential oils. You have to be careful of the ratio. So that's important to know. Um, also, how do you store your essential oils? Well, your essential oils have to be treated almost like spices. You have to keep them dry, you have to keep them out of the heat and away from light. You've probably noticed when you bought essential oils, they're either in dark brown amber glass or blue glass, so that protects the light um, from uh, sort of breaking down the essential oils. So that's an important thing. Uh, these are some that I really love that um, you can start, you can choose the ones that you like um, to begin your aromatherapy pantry. We have rosemary. So this is a small bottle of rosemary, 10 mils of rosemary. Rosemary has many of the antis that we talked about, the helpful antis, antibacterial, antidepressant, antifungal, antiviral, antiseptic. So it's actually considered a stimulating oil um, and it's good for congestion and it's considering a warming and herbaceous oil. So that brings us to this little chart here. 
Did you know that essential oils are often described by their scents? So herbaceous, rosemary, basil, marjoram, and thyme. And those are, are the herbs we do cook with, right? Then we have the spicy essential oils, cinnamon and clove and ginger and nutmeg, but especially I think in terms cinnamon and clove and ginger, those are warming spices. They provide warmth. Citrus, you think of squeaky clean, lemon, orange, grapefruit, lime, they're all very uplifting. Grapefruit's one of my favorite. That is a beautiful essential oil. Floral, some people don't like that heavy floral. I love lavender, but I know that's not a favorite of everyone. Uh, but geranium is not only floral, but it's just, it's a beautiful soft scent. Lavender, jasmine, rose. And minty, of course, that brings to mind peppermint or spearmint, uplifting, cleansing. Um, you think about um, when you, when you uh, put a peppermint lifesaver into your mouth, you can feel it go through all your nasal passages so it clears things out and it's energizing. And then we have the woody scents like sandalwood and cedarwood, again, warm. And um, a lot of people believe the tree essential oils are grounding. They provide grounding to us, and uh, I love that um, metaphor. And then earthy essential oils like patchouli. So that's one that people either love or hate. So we have our rosemary. So rosemary pairs beautifully and blends beautifully with lavender. That's a, a nice blending. Um, but for instance, when we're talking about the safety of essential oils, this is not to be used during pregnancy or with homeopathic remedies. And because it's stimulating, usually any essential oil that's stimulating, you don't even want to use it four to six hours before bed. That's how stimulating they are to the body. So that's our first one. So that would be uh, rosemary. And you'd always want to look for um, organic oils and you want to know what country they come from, right? Uh, and that's very important to know where your essential oils come from. And I'll give you, like I say in the PDF, some of the companies that I use. And then we have tea tree. So here's tea tree oil. Tea tree comes from uh, Australia. This is power, a powerful antifungal and antibacterial and antimicrobial. If you've heard of people, <clears throat> excuse me, that have had uh, foot fungus, nail fungus, this is powerful uh, fighter for that. It's in a lot of shampoos because it's cleansing and clearing, clarifying. And um, this was actually used, of course, because it's from Australia, the Aborigines, they used this as medicine. Uh, using the, the leaves from the tea tree plant. So this is a great one to have. This is great for um, recipes for cleaning around the house as well. So I like to have this on hand. The next is lavender, that's my favorite. Um, and also I wanted to mention, for instance, lavender goes by the name lavender angustifolia. So there's always Latin terminology and not to split hairs, but that is important in a case such as this, where you'd want to get the angustifolia instead of another variety, a Spanish lavender that's called spike lavender, and that doesn't have the same property. So if you're looking for the properties, the classic properties, you'd want to do your homework to make sure when you purchase it, you're purchasing the right type of lavender, the right type of rosemary, you know, that to stick by the Latin name is very important. Um, lavender is very sedative, calming, um, and that has um, very strong antibacterial, antimicrobial properties. Of course, we remember that Hippocrates, Hippocrates cleared the plague with bundles of lavender, so it's powerful. It's great for burns, obviously, because Rene Gattafos, right, with his arm in the vat of essential oils, it actually halted the, that burn, uh, the um, blistering. It's also an antiviral, so the list goes on and on. It's very good for mu muscle aches as well. Um, and then sweet orange oil. So sweet orange oil, in this one little bottle, there are 50 orange peels. That's what it takes to make essential oils. And orange is more of the um, uh, more uh, abundant oils that we have on hand and doesn't take as much as a cold pressed oil. 
but uh, sweet orange oil is considered like the joy oil, the mood lifter. Um, it's beautiful and this pairs really well with lavender. It's energizing, it helps with focus, and of course because it's vitamin C based, it helps with cold and flu, um, and it helps with respiration. But this is a good one to have on hand as it is a citrus, it's great for cleaning. So this would be a great one. Peppermint. Peppermint, we talked about <clears throat> being stimulating, uh, and it's called mentha pepperita. It is antimicrobial, anti-inflammatory, antiseptic. A lot of the antis are in there. It helps with circulation, and it's great for aching legs and feet. So you've probably seen that. A lot of foot lotions have peppermint oil in them. Um, but it can be an eye irritant. Um, so diffusing it isn't the greatest idea. You might want to try other essential oils. It is not to be used with homeopathic remedies. So we want to make sure we check with our doctor with all these essential oils. I can't stress that enough. Okay, geranium. So geranium is a beautiful essential oil. This actually is called Pelargon Pelargonium gravolonis. Uh, antifungal, antibacterial, anti-inflammatory, uh, and it helps with uh, neuralgia, it helps with the lymphatic system, and it helps us with anxiety. But this is a stimulant, so not to be used four to six hours before bed. Let me try that again, Pelargonium gravilones. gravilones. Roman chamomile. Uh, that's very healing. It's herbaceous. Um, it blends well with lavender. Again, it has all the helpful antis, uh, antiseptic, antiviral, and it helps with uh, muscle aches and pains and many other things. It helps with stress and anxiety as well. And um, if you are allergic to ragweed, you could be allergic to this. This is a cousin of ragweed, so heads up for that. Lemon citrus limon, um, cleansing. Um, lemon is great to have in your pantry as an essential oil for cleaning. Uh, it is a stimulant, so not to be used four to six hours before bed. Um, and also it is phototoxic. So it is a cold pressed oil. So that means uh, that if you apply it to your skin, within 12 hours you shouldn't be in the sun. It reacts to the sunlight. Um, so phototoxic for lemon, but for cold press, but they do have steam distilled lemons if you love it. You can search for that. Okay, I believe that is all of them. So those are the eight that um, I would recommend, and that'll be on the PDF, and you can start one at a time if you'd like um, as well. These are some of the botanicals I bought, brought. So this is uh, peppermint. This is a beautiful dried peppermint botanical. It's very strong, if I can get this off, very strong and um, sort of a green tint to it, but it takes very nicely with the essential oils added to it. And that's what we're, what we're going to be doing in the Dream Pillow. This is rosemary, it's culinary rosemary. It's just um, the same exact thing, only a smaller, smaller pieces, but that is a rosemary botanical. Lavender, this is French um, organic lavender. And I love this for my dream pillows because I love the scent of lavender. Spearmint is another botanical that I bring um, to the programs. And this is much, I think, much stronger than peppermint in nature. That's very powerful. And finally, chamomile. This is beautiful with the, uh, the buds of the chamomile plant. So that's beautiful. This is a very powerful herb. A lot of uh, homeopathic physicians use this as, uh, you know, healing teas. It's pretty amazing. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you a little bit about how you can use some natural products in your home um, to help with cleaning. So I'll have these recipes again on the PDF, but. The first one we have is a cleaning spray. So what we use in the cleaning spray is uh, white vinegar. So you should have white vinegar on hand in the home. It's, it's a great cleanser. Thinking, uh, think to the Marseille vinegar with the thieves oil. They use the vinegar base to extract the essential oil. So very powerful. 
and we should have some Castile soap on hand, which I'll tell you about. A distilled water is always good to have on hand and your essential oils. That's it for the cleansing spray. You will mix the ratios up together and you will have a nice cleansing spray um, that you can use on your counters, which is great. And then there's even a glass cleaner that has no ammonia. It's very simple with vinegar and with um, lemon essential oil and some distilled vinegar. You'll need some empty, um, you know, new uh, plastic or glass bottles would be great for that. And let me just tell you what the carrier oils are. So also this is our Castile soap. So Castile soap, what is that? So Castile soap has been around since the 12th century. It was um, discovered in Spain and Italy. It, the base of it is olive oil. So the olive oil was used to create a soap and which was very cleansing and uh, clarifying. And um, they used the olive oil, the Spanish olive oil. So in the late 1800s, uh, there was a family in Germany called the Heilbronners and they created a Castile soap and their son came over the United States in the, in the 40s, the 1940s, and he started um, the company. And he changed his name from Heel Bronner to Dr. Bronner. So Dr. Bronner's Castile Soap has been around since the 40s and it's a wonderful product. They are fair trade, they're organic, um, and it's a really a beautiful product. So this is nice to have on hand to make your cleaning solutions and you can use it as a soap as well obviously use it as soap and also um, it is used as a dispersant so when we make a spray oil and water don't mix so you need a little something to create and mix the two together so this is considered a dispersant um, the the olive oil another good one is jojoba oil so that'll be in the recipes as well this is a safflower oil. I love safflower oil to create products in the home. If I want to make um, um, a nice essential oil to rub on my skin, I would use the, this organic, pure safflower oil. It is cold pressed. So cold pressed is um, the most desirable, cold pressed and organic. So it's not refined, it's not subject to heat. That's the best um, to look for. And this is an organic product, as I said, and this needs to be kept in the fridge because oils can uh, turn rancid. So actually the smaller bottles are better if you're not gonna be using it often. So you can keep it and keep a fresh uh, stock on hand. And this one is um, from The Ordinary. That's a company that you can find at Ulta. They make cosmetics, but this is, um, not cosmetics, they make oils and, and skin preparations. This is organic cold pressed Moroccan argan oil. So you have to look for argan, um, Moroccan argan oil. And this is healing for the skin and it's healing for the hair. You've probably seen Moroccan oil products for hair, but this is healing for the skin as well. And this is a nice carrier oil to add your essential oils in. I think that's a really great product to have. Uh, another thing you might want to keep on hand is baking soda, sea salt for abrasion, and baking soda for abrasion, but always fine grain sea salt, and then Epsom salts as well. So I'll come over here and just show you what we're going to do. So here, these are the two um, little projects we do in the workshop. So I just wanted to show you how you can do this very easily at home and use your essential oils. Um, at the same time. So this is a um, four ounce, um, excuse me, an eight ounce mason jar, glass mason jar. And what we do is we're going to be making a foot soak. So not everybody has time for baths, uh, but you have time for a foot soak, especially if you're working at home these days, you can have the little foot bath underneath the computer while you're working. And this is a, an equal mixture of sea salt and Epsom salt. So a third of a cup of sea salt plus a third of a cup of Epsom salt mixed together. 
And then we're going to add our essential oils. So I usually add about 12 drops of essential oils for this amount of salt, salts. And you're going to count them. Remember, you'll use them at eye level and count the 12 drops in. This will give you about two foot baths, so a third of a cup for each foot bath. And what you want to make sure is when you add it to the foot bath, you want to make sure that the salts are totally dissolved so there's no irritant to your skin. And also if you want to add a drop or two of the Castile oil to blend it so that the water doesn't sit on the surface, you can do that. Uh, it, the oil doesn't sit on the surface, you can do that as well. And why do you want to soak your feet? So um, the number one benefit with sea salt, it has all the sea minerals in it, but the Epsom salt is the star. It's loaded with magnesium. So Epsom salt is a magnesium salt. And again, um, we were talking in another program at how magnesium regulates over 300 functions in our body. And magnesium is very healing and we can easily absorb it through our feet. So that is one way you can keep your magnesium levels uh, you know, um, restored is by soaking in Epsom salt. Epsom salt also uh, removes toxins from the body, it softens the skin, it has a variety of benefits. So that's a very easy uh, thing to make. And I sometimes like to put the botanicals, crush some botanicals in the water too. I like the lavender, of course. So I'll crush a little of the botanicals in there. You just have to be careful when you dump the water out. You don't want to dump the, um, the botanicals, strain the botanicals out so they don't clog your plumbing. Okay, and then our last um, little idea that you can do at home is you can make a dream pillow. So this will have the directions on the PDF, but this is just a rectangle about six by 13. And this represents your fabric. So I like to use fleece or a soft cotton, something that's not too thick so that you can uh, uh, smell the essential oils and the botanicals through. So what you would do is you would take a bowl, a glass bowl just like this, and you would add, um, I believe it's a half a cup of botanicals um, to these little organza bags. You can get these online, you can get these at the dollar store. And these are nice because you can uh, definitely uh, smell everything through the organza. So you would put your uh, half a cup of your botanicals, you can mix them together. Let's say you wanna do uh, lavender and chamomile. You can mix those together and then you can add a few drops of the essential oils onto the botanicals and mix it well so that it's saturated. Then you transfer it to your little organza bag. So you've got your pouch here. Then this is a little fun craft. So you would just, if you could see, you're gonna be making an envelope, okay? Just like this. And we're going to glue the sides with uh, a glue gun, or if you like to sew, you can sew it as well. So you can have an envelope. So this is what we have. Once we put this down and cut it to this size, we're going to glue the sides, not totally, just to make an envelope. And I'm gonna glue this so that now we have a pouch, okay? So now the pouch is open on top and I'm gonna put my botanicals and my essential oils. And when this might become a little stagnant or dry, you can just crush the botanicals and it will re-release the oils. So you tuck this inside and it's glued now, we're pretending, and now we have our little pouch. It's glued on the sides. And then you can take about 24 inches of ribbon. Here's one with a thinner ribbon. And you don't wanna make a knot because if you put this under your pillow, you want it to you know, have the pillow uh, be too raised. So you just, this would be glued. You'd glue the ribbon in the back, okay? and you'd glue the ribbon in the front just a little bit so that it stays, and then you'd have your dream pillow, okay? Same thing with this, you have your dream pillow, okay? So this one is sewn, so if you're into sewing, you can do that. But these are such a nice size, you can put this in your purse when you're traveling, you can put this under your bed pillow. I take it, again, as I mentioned, 
traveling as well. So these, and I keep one in the car. So um, they have a variety of applications. Not only do they smell nice, but you can remove the pouch and uh, use the pouch as um, a way to um, use your essential oils on the go. Okay. All right, so those are our crafts. And I hope that um, you take time to make those. They're really practical and they're fun to make. Um, you can make them with your children too. Okay, one last thing. I uh, always end my programs with a little bit of trivia. So I'll ask you a few questions. And um, don't forget, if you're interested in the recipes, just go online and that'll have also my contact information. If you have any questions regarding anything, here that I may not have covered for you in the PDF, just shout out to me and I'll get in touch with you. Okay, so here's our trivia. Uh, and actually these are two facts, first of all. To make one gallon of lavender oil, it takes 2,000 pounds of lavender flowers, 2,000 pounds. To make 10 gallons of orange oil, it takes 2,000 pounds of oranges. So it's amazing when you buy a very good quality essential and you're thinking how could they charge that much for that small amount of oil it's very uh it takes a lot of botanical to make an essential oil okay here are our questions bergamot oil comes from calabrian oranges discovered by this well-known italian explorer who was it was it marco polo vespucci or columbus so it's Columbus. And the bonus question is, the floral bergamot oil is also found in this popular English tea. Do you know what that tea is? Earl Grey. Some people love it, some people hate it. But that's that floral aroma is from an orange. What essential oil was valued in the Middle Ages for its ability to heal the eyes. It was also known as Oculus Christi, or the eyes of Christ. Was it rosemary, myrrh, or clary sage? It's clary sage. Clary as in clairvoyant to see. And next question, this essential oil is known as an aphrodisiac. It is a prominent ingredient in many love potions. The petals are collected at night during a waxing moon when they released their strongest fragrance. What flower is it? Is it rose, jasmine, or lily? It's jasmine. And that's why jasmine essential oil is so expensive. How many jasmine flowers do you think it takes to make one pound of essential oil? Two million, four million, or six million? It's four million. Amazing. So Nicholas Culpepper, he was a famed 16th century botanist. He prescribed rosemary. Did he prescribe it as a cure for colds, a cure for headache, a cure for memory loss, or all three? All three. That's how strong rosemary is. Uh, next question, what was one of the first essential oils believed to ever be distilled? I think I gave a hint of it in the program. It was from Persia in the 10th century. It takes 10,000 pounds of these petals to make one pound of its essential oil. Is it patchouli, rose, or geranium? So it's rose, rose from Persia. In Greek mythology, Pluto fell in love with a nymph. Pluto's wife, of course, did not appreciate this and changed her into a plant. Pluto was unable to reverse the spell but gave her a lovely, strong aroma as a consolation prize. <laughs> what was the nymph's name? Was it pepper? Was it mint? Or was it rose? 
it was mint. So peppermint. True or for us, false? Last question. Were thyme, clove, lemon, and lavender essential oils used to disinfect hospitals up until World War I? And of course, after you've heard all of this, you know the answer is yes. It's true. All right, well, I want to thank you for your attention, and I hope you learned a little something. Uh, send in for the PDF, and if you have any questions, give me a buzz, and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you.